Uh, like always, appreciate you guys uh, coming out and, and covering Penn State football and, and Penn State athletics. Um, obviously, just over there at the send-off uh, for the basketball team, which, which is awesome. Um, been a big week for Penn State athletics. You got men's basketball and wrestling competing in NCAA postseason. Um, but there's really a ton of other teams within the athletic department that have had great years as well. Track and field, women, women's gymnastics, women's hockey, softball, men's hockey, men's volleyball, men's lacrosse, women's lacrosse, fencing. I can, I can go on and on, and I hate to do this because if I don't mention somebody, uh, then, then someone's going to be upset. But there's so many examples of the entire athletic department and university thriving right now uh, under Dr. Ben DePudi and and Pat Kraft's um, leadership. So that's been great. You know, we talk about, you know, kind of what we're trying to get accomplished this spring. You know, talking to Coach Yursich, uh, which are spring objectives, improving the run game, increase our mental and physical toughness, improve our execution and communication, improve ball security, improve our explosiveness in the run and pass game. And then we got to identify leaders and empower them in the leadership positions defensively with Manny reestablish our physical, mental, and emotional toughness, create habits to play with relentless effort, master leverage and tackling systems, create havoc with all of the uh, you know, havoc plays, tackles for loss, sacks, PBUs, force fumbles, and interceptions, develop fundamentals and technique, identify leaders and empower them, and then obviously figure out, really in, in all three phases, but uh, figure out who our 11 best players are, and then how do we create as much depth as we possibly can behind them. And then on special teams, continue to develop fundamentals and techniques for our special teams units, uh, develop and identify top special teams personnel, our two deep, again, for all units, identify leaders and empower them in leadership positions, and then cultivate special teams really kind of throughout our entire organization. Um, Obviously excited to watch the 11 new high school early enrollees and then also the four uh, transfers that are on campus. Excited to see what they're going to be able to do and how many of those guys will end up factoring in. Uh, some of those we'll figure out right, right away. We'll see that they're going to have a chance. Other, other guys um, will go through the spring kind of feeling things out and then obviously um, we'll have a chance to truly compete in, in summer camp. Um, some hires that obviously you guys are aware of, but Marquis, uh, Marcus Hagens, um, I've been really impressed and pleased uh, with, with how he's been able to come in and, and really you know, not only build relationships with our players, but their trust, uh, and same with our staff. Obviously, you saw the announcement of Dion Barnes yesterday, which, which went over extremely well. Um, that, that literally was decided yesterday. Dion found out yesterday, our team found out yesterday, so that's not like old uh, videotape that you guys are just getting. Um, Calvin Lowry, another letterman, has been awesome. And then I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this or not, but Torrance Brown is now back with us as a graduate assistant uh, replacing Dion's position. So uh, it's great to have Torrance back. Torrance was part of our initial recruiting class, uh, was a defensive end for us. So really good hit having him back. And then really kind of last note is, you know, just cool to have, I think we have 10 lettermen now uh, in the building and um, obviously a ton of uh, alumni as well, which I talked about at the board meeting. Uh, in a lot of different roles. So I think that's been a real positive for us. So uh, excited about the spring. Today will be our first day to get out there and be flying around and get some work done and get some evaluations. Um, it feels like spring ball weather out there, so that's good too. Um, and look forward to answering your guys' questions. Start with Rich Garcella, Redding Eagle, and then we'll go to Mark Wilgenrich. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <clears throat> about Dion. It seems by the response from your staff, the player last night, it was a very popular decision. What do you believe are his strengths, and why did it take so long to set to pick him as the new defensive line coach? Yeah, again, uh, I, I think, it, it, first of all, it depends on your lens, right? Long. Some, some people go a long time. We're usually able to, to move quickly. Um, but the length of it, 
I was hoping to be able to get done before spring break. I always want to be able to tell the players first. That's hard to do in today's business. We've done a pretty good job of the players hearing it before it's leaked on the media. That's something that's very important to me. Um, I think they deserve the right to hear first. So um, once we had not made the decision before spring break, um, then I didn't feel like there was a rush to do it because my plan was to do it in person uh, when we got back either Sunday or Monday. But the other thing is, you know, we ended up interviewing a ton of people for it. Um, uh, people that we had relationships with, people that we didn't have relationships with. Um, to be very honest with you, sometimes we go through the interview process uh, for guys that we definitely are going to you know, consider hiring. And sometimes we're interviewing guys to get a feel for to see if they're a possible candidate in the future down the road. So kind of a wide variety, NFL guys, college guys. Um, and the other thing is a little bit like that was in that video is although Dion is a letterman and although the players and former players felt strongly about me hiring Dion, uh, ultimately, I ha had to hire the right person, and you know, if that ended up being Dion, then great. It's a win on a lot of different levels, um, but but I needed to make sure of that. And throughout that process, it just it just became more and more obvious that this was the right thing to do. So, did I did I answer both your questions? We got you muted now. So whether I did or not, <laughs> what, what 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 are his strengths? Do you believe? Yeah, you know, I think obviously, you know, Dion's got his collegiate experience here at Penn State. And one of the things that I probably wasn't as aware of, uh, he's done a really good job of taking everything in uh, and being very intentional about it. I, I, I take time to meet with the GAs and analysts and give them my perspective on things that they should be doing. Um, that's going to be important for their development. It's going to be important for the interview process. You know, it's interesting. We kind of went back and talked about, I remember, you know, I used to have uh, interviews. I remember with Joe Brady, you know, either coming in early or staying light, late and doing kind of interview process with those guys and giving them feedback. You know, we had a ton of guys that, that we did that with. Um, and Dion was actually doing a really good job um, of everything we talked about taking very serious and being intentional and adding things to kind of his game. I think also kind of his background, he's played for really good D-line coaches. He's coached for very good D-line coaches. His time with Brent Pry, I think, was valuable. His time with Manny Diaz was, was valuable. Um, and then I think the other thing that kind of goes into this as well is his time of being a trainer. You know, uh, when Dion was coaching in high school, he was training a lot of the high profile defensive linemen in that region, whether they were from Philadelphia or New Jersey. And I'm talking, when I talk about high profile, I'm talking about guys in the NFL. Uh, he was training all those guys. And I think what I've watched with him over the last couple of years is he's made the transition from being a trainer to being a coach. And there are aspects and similarities of those two jobs that, that are similar, but there's a lot of other aspects that go into it as well. Um, I also think his ability to relate to the players um, and recruits is also going to be a strength of his. Uh, he has the ability to be hard and demanding on them in a way that they respect and can relate to, which a lot of times younger coaches, they, they have a hard time with that. Um, so I think, you know, obviously his ability to relate to the coaches, his understanding and fundamentals and techniques of the position. Um, and then one of the things I was impressed with during the interview process is his understanding of the big picture, not only defensively, schematically, uh, but then also um, in terms of all the other things, in terms of managing the room, in terms of you know setting standards and expectations of the room, uh, 
in terms of you know um, academics and his role on being the head coach in his position. I think the fact that you know he's literally a paper away from finishing his master's degree, I think that sends a message. Um, I'm not saying a master's degree in college coaching is a must, but I do think it, it sends the right message and it illustrates the right message. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we feel really good about Dion. And then I think, you know, whenever you can promote from within, which is what I would typically prefer to do across the board, he understands our culture already. He understands the defensive scheme. So when you go out and hire maybe a more experienced coach from the outside, you get that, but then that guy's got to spend time learning the defense and, and understanding the culture. So you can make arguments both ways. Um, but I was very impressed with Dion and how he interviewed. Now, the last thing I'll say, I know this is a long answer, but I think the other thing that really jumped out to me that I thought he did a good job in the interview process is you felt not only did you hear it, but you felt his passion for coaching D-line. You felt his passion for Penn State. And you felt his passion for this specific group of, of defensive linemen that he has a relationship with. So, um, you know, it was kind of all of that. It was, it was all of that. Mark Bogenrich, all Penn State. And then Frank Bodani. Hi, James. How are you doing? Hey, well, how are you, buddy? Good, thanks. Regarding the quarterbacks um, this spring, how do you plan to cycle their reps among Drew Bow and Jackson? How is that going to be different without a returning starter back? You guys want to talk about the, the boot and the scooter? You guys, <laughs> you guys don't want to talk about that? That was like hot news. And then, and then two days later, he's not in it anymore, and I don't get any more questions about it. But from a rotation standpoint, um, Obviously, we'd like to keep it as even as possible. We kind of have it structured that way at practice, specifically um, with Bo and Drew. Um, try to keep it as, as even from a rep standpoint as possible. Um, but right now, we really have it structured in a way based on our depth right now that all three of them will get the same number of reps. Um, I think that's really important in spring ball, that not just at the quarterback position, but at all the positions, that everybody's getting an opportunity to co compete and develop, just like we try to do at the beginning of training camp. And then obviously at some point we got to transition um, and, and get ready for the, for the first game. Um, so the plan is to split the reps evenly, and then obviously as, as you know, we start to get a little bit of bumps and bruises and have to have to adjust the practice um, and it may be I think a few years ago you guys remember we were short with offensive alignment well I talked to you guys about it's not just offensive alignment it stunts the development at other positions as well so uh, right now it's starting out even um, reps across the board for all three of them and then you know obviously specific to, to Bo and Drew um, really making sure that we protect those two guys' reps as much as we possibly can. Um, there could be some situations where uh, Bo actually gets more reps uh, by the end of spring uh, because I think there's some things that, that we may want to do uh, with Bo to take advantage of his skill set and maybe you know, create an opportunity for him to get some more experience. Um, you know, not only during spring ball, but in games next year as well. So we'll, we'll see how that all plays out. Frank Bodani, York Daily Record, the Mike Gross. Hey, good afternoon, James. Hey, Frank. Good to talk to you. Good to talk um, to you. Yeah, your defensive line Frank, is very close to the camera. Know. You don't have to back up. You're a handsome guy. You can pull it off. <laughs> Older than you, okay, but still handsome. Are you older than me? Yeah, a little bit. 53. Going to be 54. You look much better than me. Thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> you always throw me off my questions. Yeah, yeah, whenever I do this with you guys, you guys like are uncomfortable. You guys are physically uncomfortable when I ask like you guys questions. It's like Thanksgiving all over again. Oh, my God. Yes, that was easy. <laughs> right. Okay, so let me think. Okay, defensive line. What's coming up, Easter? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, it's, it's kind of coming. Up, okay, yeah. I'll leave you alone. Okay, thanks. Um, your defensive line, defensive tackle. Look at you. 
Talk about your depth there. What do you expect this spring from those guys? How Dion's relationship can help immediately, with, with, especially with the line, with, with especially with the guys inside. Some people wonder about your your depth there going forward. Yeah, I, I think we feel good um, about the depth that we have there. Obviously, you'd like you'd like more, but when you talk about, we got four guys that have played a decent amount of football. Three specifically that have played a decent amount of football with Beeman, Durant, Elise, and Vandenberg. Those guys have all played. Uh, and then we got two guys that we're excited about with Artis and Townley. And then, you know, Siop is a guy that's just transitioned over there, so see what he's going to be able to do as well. And then we got Ty Blanding coming in in the summer, so we'll see how that plays out. You never really kind of depend or expect a true freshman to be able to play there. Um, but you never know, you know, Durant, Zane Durant was able to do it last year. So we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, Beeman, Elise, Durant, Vandenberg, those guys. And then we have some guys, obviously, as you guys know, Izard has played a ton of football. Um, I'm not sure how much he'll be able to go uh, this spring with some bumps and bruises that you guys will find out about, obviously, when you come out to practice. Um, but when you factor him in, then you really got five guys that have played a ton of football at, at Penn State. And to me, if we can have a two and a half deep at every position uh, with guys that have played in games and, and showed that we can win with, uh, then great. I would like us to be a little bit bigger um, at the tackle. I think there's some games where we're able to get away with it because of our athleticism and our quickness. Um, but to win the way we want to win, we need both. We need, we need size and quickness and athleticism. Um, you know, I think, I think Dion's going to be able to build off of what we've done the last couple of years, but I also think he's going to put his stamp on it as well. I know one of the things that's really important to him is, um, you know, effort. And I think, no, that sounds like a, a simple thing, but we think there's a little bit left in the tank to get our guys to play on a different level, you know, when it comes to effort. Um, I'm a big believer on both sides of the ball. You guys have heard me talk about this before. Is um, uh, the game starts up front, whether it's the defense or whether it's the offense. Um, to your point, I think we got a chance to be really talented uh, at defensive end. Uh, I think we got a chance to be really good at defensive tackle, but there's probably a little bit more question marks there and a little less depth. I also could see us maybe getting into some situations where in passing downs, we're getting more of those defensive ends on the field uh, if they show that they're able to, to rush as in, in, in internal players as well. So um, you know, I know Dion wants to put his stamp on it. I think, I think we'll have a better idea for that after spring of what we did well, what we need to build on. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it all starts with relationships. He's got really strong relationships, but I also think they need to, the players need to understand, and I know Dion addressed this with him yesterday, like this is not going to be the same Dion. Um, as much as he thinks he's going to be, and as much as they think he's going to be, you know, when you're in a complementary role uh, compared to, you know, running the show and running the room, there's a transition that happens. Um, and you know it's it's going to be it's going to be fun and it's going to be exciting and and I also think we all got to play a part in that as well in in, in supporting you know Dion in that room through this transition that would be for whoever we are. Mike Gross, Lincoln Star Newspapers, and then Donnie Collins. Good afternoon, James. Hey, Mike. Hi. Good man. How are you? Great, thanks. Um, based on what you said a couple minutes ago about the quarterbacks. Um, uh, it, it, it sounded like like maybe you're considering the possibility of playing Bo and I, I realize it's March. I, I understand that, but uh, but you're going to ask anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> um, playing both of them and maybe using Bo as a change of a pace, using his running ability. Is that am I am I reaching or is that sort of obvious? Is is that what you're thinking in terms of experimenting with? Let's say. Well, this spring is just to get those guys as many reps as we possibly can uh, to be able to evaluate them, to create a competition, and to also create depth. Um, 
I do think if you look at last year, you know, we had a very specific plan to get to get Drew um, as many reps as we possibly could uh, to build that depth and to build that experience. So if we needed him, he was ready, but also to help us, you know, this year moving forward. Um, this year's a little bit different because we're back to kind of having a true competition again. Um, and then not only the true competition, uh, to somewhat answer your question, Bo has got some athletic traits that, that are desirable and, and maybe make sense for us to use if they give us the best chance to win. But you know, before, before practice has even started, it's, it's hard to say that. So we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I know you want me to give you the game plan for West Virginia today, but, uh, but I understand where you're, where you're coming from with the question. But I do think there's a little bit different dynamic based on, uh, I would say, Sean and Drew's skill sets were probably more uh, similar. They were different, but they were probably more similar where um, I think maybe the differences between uh, Drew and Bo may be a little bit uh, more dramatic in terms of their skill sets. Donnie Collins, Grand Times Tribune, and then we'll come here in the room. Hi, James. How you doing? Doing well. Uh, I know you got some guys coming in after spring, but depth of running back behind uh, your top two guys, Nick and Katron, how how much do you hope to develop there, uh, depth wise in, in the spring, and do you think you have potential for that? Yeah, we'll we'll get those guys a ton of reps, not not just to to develop depth, um, but also just to be smart with the other two, right? It's it's for a number of reasons, and then that's you know that's the exact reason why we ended up signing two running backs and uh, ended up being two high school running backs. <coughs> But that was the whole idea of signing two because whether the third back comes from who we currently have in the program or whether the third back comes from an incoming freshman, that's what we got to figure out between this spring uh, and then summer camp as well um, for depth, but also also to make sure that, that we're not overworking those two guys either. Mark? Hey James, uh, we know a lot about your two veteran t veteran tight ends. I was wondering, what are you kind of expecting out of Dinkins and uh, Cross? Because we didn't see a whole lot of them last year. And in Mega, we look at him weighing in at 269 on the roster. Is he going to be a tight end throughout his career, or is that a guy that you may be looking at somewhere else at some point? Yeah. So uh, we were very transparent with Mega from the beginning. Um, we had conversations about position flexibility, whether it was D-line, uh, whether it was tight end, whether it was O-line, and, and he was open to that um, as long as he was going to be given the opportunity to come in and, and compete at tight end. So with us, all of our guys, we have open conversations with them during the recruiting process about how we see them. I think you saw it a little bit with Driver last year. Uh, so we'll see how it plays out. The thing I, I have heard from the players is he's got really good hands um, and he moves well you know, out on the field, you know, talking to strength coaches and, and, and watching him in winter workouts and then again talking to the guys. So he could be one of those kind of exceptions where he's just a massive you know, tight end, uh, maybe more of a true why. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, you know, but he is big. Uh, he did he did have uh, an injury early on when he first got here, which I actually also think limited some of his training and development uh, in terms of putting on muscle. Uh, so I think he's going to continue uh, to grow. But you never know. He could be, you know, the exception. You know, we saw a couple of those guys at the combine that are 280 pound tight ends. You know, you never know. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, um, Dinkins and Cross. Yeah. Dinkins and Cross. Uh, Dinkins is a guy who's obviously been in the program now, and I think understands the expectations and the standards, and has got a lot of skills to work with, and has shown some really good flashes <coughs> last year. Um, you know, Theo and 
Tyler Warren got some bumps and bruises. And in some ways, it's a blessing in disguise because Dinkins, Cross, and um, you know, Joey and, and Mega are going to get a ton of reps this spring. So I think it's it's really valuable because in some ways we know who you know Theo and Tyler are. Um, Dinkins has really shown some flashes. Um, this spring will be really important for him um, to take that next step and just be more consistent. And then, you know, Cross was a guy that got an injury early on in the summer last year and it, and it limited, you know, his opportunity to be able to compete, but he really handled things well. He's worked his tail off. Uh, so those guys will get a ton of reps. You know, really all, all four <coughs> of those guys will get a ton of reps, Dinkins, Cross, Joey, and Mega. Uh, so we'll we'll see how that that whole thing plays out, but but we're excited to watch them. Um, I think we kind of know obviously what we have with Theo and Tyler, but it's going to be really good to figure out kind of where we are with this other group. Are, are are any of those guys ready to truly compete with Tyler and Theo, or is it truly a competition to figure out who's going to be the third tight end next year? Which I think you guys know is a big part of our offense and what we do. One of the things I do really like about this group is we've got a chance to have more depth. Where last year, you know, if we had an injury or two at tight end, we had to really get away from some of our packages. Uh, I think these guys are going to allow us to, to have the depth that we're not really worried about losing a package based on not having enough, you know, proven, versatile uh, tight ends. Hey, James, how are you? Sorry. No problem. Um, is 15 practices a lot, not a lot? How do you attack this from a how much can you get out of spring practice and how much can a player <coughs> rise on the depth chart through 15 practices? Yeah, I, I think a guy can make a significant move in, in spring ball. Very rarely will it be kind of the deciding factor for next fall because what I love about spring ball, it gives the player and the coaches a really good indication of where they are and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And then I think you guys know I'll, I'll have my end of the year meetings with all of them. I'll sit down with each player on the team um, and give them specific feedback. So now they can say, okay, from spring ball, here's my strengths, here's my weaknesses. These are the things I need to work on all summer leading into training camp. So. I got a better chance to help the team. I got a better chance to compete. So I think there's a ton of value in it. I think 15 practices to me is, is kind of a sweet spot. Um, it really, we try to mirror spring ball with training camp. So, you know, although it, it's, it's probably much better from an installation standpoint because you're, being, you're able to go meeting one day, practice the next, and stagger it that way, where in training camp it's every day. Um, so I think from a learning perspective, it's probably more valuable. But then my point is, is really our 15 installs in spring ball will be very similar to our first 15 practices in summer camp. So it's almost like, okay, now they've been through it once, now they get it the second time during summer camp. Uh, the other thing I think will be helpful is it's again it's early to say this but based on our numbers right now we anticipate going back to a traditional spring game like we've had in the past i know a lot of people have gone away from that i think there's value in it i also think that we're one of the unusual schools where where when seventy-five thousand people show up to watch a spring game i'd like to be able to give them a spring game um, and I'm not even sure the number, an important a big number guy like, like tailgating. Like I have no idea how many are out there. Um, but we're one of the unique places. We're gonna have more people at our spring game than most people have for a regular game in the fall. So whenever we can create a spring game atmosphere, we wanna do that for the fans. But I also think there's value. There's value for me in seeing the guys play under the lights technically, I guess not, not technically I should say, but under the lights and in front of the fans and with the media there and everybody's eyes on them and watching. Because some guys rise to that occasion and some guys, you know, um, you know feel, you know, the, the pressure and anxiety from that. So figuring that out, is there's value in that. Uh, but then there's also some value in my coaching staff too. I like to break the coaching staff up. 
Uh, I like to give opportunities for other guys on the offensive and defensive side of the ball to call a game. Uh, so when you're able to break it up into a ones versus twos, um, I don't typically have Manny and Mike calling the offense for both sides. I'll, I'll give other guys opportunities to do that as well, and I think that's a really good professional development opportunity too. So um, I think spring ball is really valuable, especially the way the way we try to do it. Hey James, how you doing? Good man, how are you? I'm good. I have two for you on your offensive line. The, the plan right now going into spring to replace Juice. Who, who are you looking at? I would I would imagine Hunter is in that discussion. And also, you didn't really have the left side of your offensive line for the stretch run. Olu and Landon were both hurt. Can you kind of give us an update kind of where they are maybe going into spring? Yeah, good question. So Olu will be full go. Um, Landon Tangwell, I think, will be full go by practice three. Um, we, got a, we got a number of guys. They'll come out in the first two practices and do kind of more individuals and job throughs. Uh, individuals full speed and then depending on how they do with those then then they'll have an opportunity by practice three to you know the medical staff will determine do we need to keep modifying them or, or are they in a good place um, so it'll be great to have those two guys back um, obviously proven guys have played a ton of football for us and then at center yeah I think you know Hunter I think uh, is going to be in a competition with with Dawkins I think there's some other guys. I think I think Benga will take some center reps. Um, I think Wormley, you know, could take some center reps as well. Uh, and then Ruley and Harvey will be there as well. So it allows us to have, you know, on paper a four deep from practice perspective, which I think would be really valuable for those guys. But um, you know, part of it is Hunter will also be one of those guys that starts out slightly modified for the first two practices to see how it goes. Um, but but it'll be a competition with, with you know, Norzad and Dawkins and, and some of those other guys that we have listed as guards, but we'll also get them some center reps as well. And then, you know, Ruley's a guy that's, that's done some really nice things that the staff's been, been impressed with. So we'll see kind of the step he's taken, you know, since, since this season. Yeah. Hey, James, um, where do you feel right here in the back? Um, how do you feel the expectations are going into this spring versus uh, last spring? You know, considering you had the rough end to 2021 and now you're coming off of the Rose Bowl win. Yeah, the, those things really don't factor for us internally. I think obviously externally, I don't kind of uh, try to concern myself with the, with the external um, opinions or expectations and those types of things. We're approaching it the same way we, we've always approached it. Um, where we got to get better and I think one of the things I talked about with the staff this morning is we have to remember although this is a competitive environment it's it's about it's about Penn State getting better it's not about the offense winning the defense winning it's you know now don't get me wrong once we get to competition let's let's get after it but my point is there shouldn't be any surprises right like Manny should know what the offense is installing so he can have his players prepared for it. Mike should have a very good understanding of what Manny and the defense are installing, so there's no surprises. Now, once everybody knows and you can have your play players prepare for what they may see in practice every single day, now it's competition, but we're not trying to trick each other you know, uh, in practice. It's, okay, this is, this is what we're installing on offense, this is what we're installing on defense, and you need to be aware of aware of that and how that impacts our offense. So if it's a heavy install on defense, you know, do you want to have a heavy install on offense because it magnifies kind of the looks that the guys are going to see? So that's kind of the fine balance. I'm a big believer that that's important for the head coach to do is to manage that because when you're trying to teach and lay a foundation. You really don't want to be getting exotic looks early on in training camp or early on in spring ball. I've been through that myself as a coordinator. I don't think that's the right way to teach. Um, and you know that's, that's kind of the value from it. So our, our, our idea is to get better this spring, really at every single position, individually, collectively by positions, collectively by side of the ball, and then collectively as a, as a team and as a staff. Um, 
you know, and then obviously we'll take all that information and, and go into the spring. And you guys will be talking about the end of spring and you know, basically what you saw and what you liked in the spring game and what you saw and you liked from the seven minutes of practice that we let you come watch. Um, you know, and then obviously everybody will be writing, you know, articles and all those magazines will come out in the summer that I'll be sitting on the beach reading and seeing if I think they're accurate or not. And then, you know, we'll open against West Virginia uh, at home, which will be a huge game and a huge opportunity for us that we're excited about. Uh, but right now we're just, we're just trying to get better, you know, as, a, as our program and our units. So Hey James, uh, how comfortable are you, are you right now with the state of the wide receiver position on the team uh, and the guys that you currently have? And ideally, would that rotation look like last year where you have your three guys who tap out when they need to come out, or would you rather rotate more organically? Yeah, I think in general, um, you'd love to have three guys that have, that have um, separated themselves from the pack, and they are in until they're tapping. Um, now, there may be a situation where there's a fourth guy that won't allow himself to be separated. And then to me, I've always felt like it's really important. Say you have two positions. I constantly talk to the coaches about this. Say you have two defensive ends. I really think it's important that if you have them ranked one, two, three, and four, your four needs to be behind your number one because that two needs the three right behind him trying to take his job every single day. Typically, your one should be, should be an established guy that's going to work no matter what. Um, obviously, you hope there's tight competition at every position, but my point is is that two be behind that three is really important. So we'd love to be in a position where we have a two deep where there's not a significant drop off. But you could also make the argument, if there's not a significant drop off, then, then your ones aren't who you want them to be or need them to be. Um, that room, we think there's the talent in that room to go where we want to go. Um, I think we have to be tougher um, and we have to be more consistent. And if you look at college football and if you look at the NFL, the Probably the area where you can change games the fastest in college football in the NFL right now uh, is that wide receiver. It's, you know, I think it's something that we all, from a common sense perspective, have always understood. There's just more space out there. You know, so if you get somebody out there that can either run past everybody or catch a short ball and make people miss and go 80, that changes the game. Um, it also changes the defense. So it's interesting, you know, it may impact the running game as much as anything. Uh, because if, if people are concerned that you have a guy that they don't feel like they can leave in a one-on-one -on -one situation, now you're having to have a safety over the top all the time, then obviously that's going to create opportunities in the running game as well. So um, I think the potential is there. We got to go earn it, and we got to go show it. And like I've talked to you guys in the past, I think the biggest word for me is consistency. And that's not at wide receiver; that's at every position. You know, pretty much everybody in that room is there for a reason. They have the ability to do it. They've shown flashes. It's about consistency. Take Frank, and then we'll finish with Audrey. Hey, James, over on your far left. So How you, doing? you were back there earlier. Right? Yeah, I hop the fence though. Appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask you your philosophy about getting bigger at defensive tackle because um, you're working with players that you have on the roster currently. Uh, some of those guys dropped weight, most of them stayed relatively the same size. So I, I guess from a big picture perspective, are you willing to sacrifice athleticism in order to get that size? No. And secondarily, you mentioned effort, you want some more effort out of your defensive tackles. Does that extend beyond plays on the field to stuff outside in this area? And generally, how, what's your philosophy on how to get bigger? So no, we are never going to, um, we are never going to chase size for size sake. That's where Leanne, our nutritionist, and that's where Chuck Losey, the strength coach, 
all of our weights um, are based on body composition. So if you got a guy who's naturally a high body fat guy, we're not going to ask him to put on weight because he's most likely naturally just going to put on more body fat. Um, and we have a range really for every position based on not only our college experience, but also if you look at the NFL draft, what those numbers are. Uh, so we got a pretty good range of are you in an acceptable range where you should be? And if you're on the low end, then you should be able to carry more weight. And we obviously always want it to be lean mass. If you're carrying lean mass, it should actually make you more athletic. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to gain weight and reduce body fat at the same time, which is easier said than done. That's also why we're really putting the emphasis on doing it in the off season because we don't want to be messing with it during the season. And that's where if you can gain a pound every week or a pound every two weeks or every three weeks and just gradually put it on the right way throughout the season, that's, that's what we want. But no, it's, it's not chasing size for the sake of size. Um, it's, if you talk about like a baseball player, I think they say you know, like a five tool player, is that what they say in baseball, is that, is that accurate? Like it's the same thing like in football, right? Strength is a tool. Um, speed is a tool. Quickness is a tool. Length is a tool. When you, when you talk about football, the game of football, right, is about creating space on offense and taking space away on defense. And you can do that through speed to cover areas of the field. You can do that with length to cover areas of the field. And hopefully a combination of both, of speed and length. Size, when we're talking about weight, is also a weapon. Um, but you'd like to try to be able to have just enough of each of those variables to have the impact you want. Um, but it's, it's one of your tools, you know, your football IQ, your intelligence, how quickly you process information. There are all these tools and traits that we're looking for. And size is a weapon. You know, it, it is a weapon. Um, I think you guys, like, look at Benga. You're going to look at Benga, and I think you guys see us, we have them listed at like 359 or 69 pounds right now. You're going to see him. If there is such a thing, he's the best 369 pounds you've ever seen in your life. He's just a big human being um, and carries it extremely well. That's a weapon for him. Um, you know, let, let me preface this, and then I'll, I'll shut up. I'm a huge Aaron Donald fan. Aaron Donald has hurt college football and defensive tackles, in my opinion, because every single one of these kids think they're Aaron Donald. Like, well, I'm going to lose weight and be more athletic. Well, there's been one Aaron Donald in 50 years. At his size, to be as disruptive as he is, and as strong and as quick and as explosive, the problem is, Everybody thinks they're the exception. And the reality is there's been a lot more 300 pound defensive tackles that have had great NFL and college careers than there's been the 275, 85 pound D tackles. Don't get me wrong. If Aaron Donald wants to come to Penn State, we want him. Like, but, but our guys need to understand that's the exception, not the norm. And we gotta find kind of the happy medium between the two that makes sense. But they have everybody, everybody thinks they're Aaron Donald now. That guy, you know, I don't know about you guys, there hasn't been many of them in the history of, of the game. Finish off with Audrey. About the boot and scooter. No, just joking. Um, <laughs> complete joke. Wanted to ask you about your right tackles. Good one. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't buy it, I thought you might. Um, I wanted to ask about your right tackles and specifically Drew Shelton. Is he somebody that you want to try on that right side? Because obviously you guys didn't have him last spring. Yeah, so back to kind of what I was talking about before. Yeah, Drew will be at right tackle uh, competing with Caden Wallace. We're going to try to figure out if we can, you know, uh, create a competition to figure out who is that fourth tackle or second left tackle, however you want to look at it, 
or are we going to be in a situation where whoever the third tackle is the backup at both right and left tackle, or is he the third tackle and then somebody moves over? Um, that's what we're trying to figure out. Obviously, you'd love to be in a situation where you feel like you got four tackles that you can play with and win at this level, or it's like last year where we felt like you know Drew Shelton was that next guy. Um, you know, this spring and summer camp, Drew will be competing for a starting job, and that's what we have to figure out. Is there a fourth tackle on the roster? You know, what I hope is their spot, kind of like we talked about. I'd like to have a two and a half deep at every position. Um, but if there's not, there, need, there needs to be at least a third guy that we think we can win with, with a fourth guy who's developing, if that makes sense. Um, so right now, you know, Drew, Drew will be at right tackle, um, competing, uh, but there will also be you know, obviously opportunities for him uh, and others to get some work at left tackle too. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coach.